Hello, and thank you for tuning in to our program today. My name is William Stewart. I'd like to encourage you to open up your Bible and follow along as we study. In today's program, we're going to consider the Bible a book from God. We're going to consider whether it indeed is the product of God, as those who are Christians believe, or whether it's just simply a book of fairy tales and myths, as so many believe when they reject the Bible. Logic demands that we test something before we judge it as true or false. In fact, in 1 John chapter 4 and at verse 1, the Apostle John indicated that we need to do so. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so what we're going to do in today's program is essentially test the Word of God, test the Bible, whether it is of God or not. To begin with, let me ask the question, what would you expect if God wrote a book? What kinds of characteristics would a book from God bear? What kinds of questions would a book from God answer? So far as characteristics, we might suggest that it would have perfect unity, that it would not have any contradiction. We might again say that it would not be bound by time or location. If it's coming from the eternal God, then it ought to be something that would not be bound by time or location upon this earth. It would have a message of hope. If he has provided a Savior, if he has provided a hope for the people on the earth, then we would expect to find a message of hope within a book written by God. And we might also expect it to be easy to understand. May I suggest to you that these four characteristics that we've just pointed out, all are fulfilled or all are found in the scriptures. It is of perfect unity. Though it was written by over 40 different writers, over a period of 1,600 years, and all those from different backgrounds, it has perfect unity. It has no contradiction within it. It's not bound by time or location, for it was applicable to those who were in Palestine in the first century, and it is as applicable to those who are in Canada or the United States today in the 21st century. It gives us a message of hope telling us about salvation through Jesus Christ. And it is easy to understand. In fact, the Bible is written in either a fourth or fifth grade level, easy to understand, and in fact, it commands us to understand. Ephesians chapter 5 and at verse 17, we're commanded to understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, what kinds of questions would a book from God address? Perhaps why I am here. Recall in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, Solomon comes to this conclusion. He says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Or some translations say this is the whole duty of man. We might expect God to address the question of where I am going. The Bible tells us of two destinations in eternity that all individuals will either go to heaven or to hell. And so it tells us where we may go in eternity and tells us how it is that we will get to either place, either through obedience to the will of God and entrance into heaven or through disobedience, hell. We might also expect a book from God to address the question of how the universe began. In Genesis chapter 1 and at verse 1, the whole book begins in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so there are just a few questions we might expect God to deal with if he wrote a book, and indeed those are addressed and dealt with in the Bible. But let's go a little further and look at some other evidence to see whether the Bible is from God or not, some specific items. Certainly, if it is a book from God, we should expect that it would make a claim to be a book from God. Now, understand that it doesn't prove inspiration just because it claims inspiration, but we would expect such. 
if God were the author. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, at verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or all Scripture is God-breathed. There is that claim for inspiration. Also in Second Peter chapter 1, and at verse 20 and 21, we read this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so once more we see that the Scriptures, according to the writing of Peter, came from God. There is that claim of inspiration. And there are several claims of inspiration as we go through the Bible from beginning to end where we find that God is identified as the source of this book. We might consider the Bible's indestructibility to be an evidence that it is a book from God. Many have tried through the centuries to destroy the Bible, to snuff out the Bible, and yet here it is still with us today. In fact, the Romans in the early part of the first millennium A.D. made an attempt to destroy the Bible, but then a generation later, the Roman government was paying for the production of Bibles. There was a French philosopher by the name of Voltaire who said that his writings would be around in a hundred years and be common use in people's homes but that the Bible would only be found in museums and such. Well, a hundred years removed from that statement, Voltaire's work was more of a museum item. I don't even think it attained to that measure. You can barely find anything written by Voltaire. But the Bible is in just about every household for use and for reading and for edification. In Matthew chapter 24 and at verse 35, notice what Jesus says about the word of God. He says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. There is an absolute claim of indestructibility for the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, he says. The, the foundation of the word of God is stronger than than the foundation of our very universe. That which is around us is eventually going to be destroyed, but the word of God will by no means pass away, the Lord says. In First Peter and chapter 1, we find Peter making a similar type statement. First Peter chapter 1, at verse 24 and 25, he says, All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. And so here's Peter claiming of the word of God that it lives and abides forever. It will endure forever. The word of God is not destructible. Again, I want us to consider the unity of the Bible. We had talked about the fact that about 40 writers were involved in a period of about 1,600 years. We have the product of that, 66 books that are broken up into two large sections that deal with various topics, and yet there is no contradiction to be found. Now, understand that if you gather together 40 different men and have them talk about a variety of topics in, in any circle, you're going to have all kinds of disagreement and different ideas, and yet here there is absolute unity in the message that was written. It's not based upon collusion, because they were spread out over 1,600 years. They weren't together in the same place. They were in different regions, and they wrote in different languages. They had different backgrounds and were in different circumstances, and yet the message is one message. It is not contradictory, but has perfect unity. 
Part and parcel of looking at the unity that the Bible has is to look at the manuscript evidence for the Bible. Uh, understand that the Bible was not written in English as we read it today, that we're reading a translation from the original languages. And so we need to consider, well, what does the manuscript evidence say about the Bible? The Old Testament accuracy is ensured by the process that they used in copying. There are not a whole lot of copies of the Old Testament available. There are certainly several, but it's not a huge amount of, of copies available. But the process that was used by the scribes in order to transcribe an Old Testament document was very meticulous. You see, what they would do is they would write, not in their own handwriting, but they would do the copy in the handwriting style of the original writer. And so if a man was writing the book of Genesis, he would be writing accordingly in, in Moses' handwriting. Also, the scribes would know what the very center character of the book was. And so after having written, they would go through and count through the characters, and if they came to the center character and it was not what it was supposed to be, they would scrap the whole document and start again. In addition to that, if in the process of their writing, they made an error, they would scrap the whole document and start again. The meticulous way in which they prepared a copy of the Word of God in the Old Testament ensures that we have an accurate copy of those things that were originally given. Now, when we come to the New Testament, the accuracy of the New Testament is ensured not by the process used in copying, but by the volume of manuscript evidence that's available. Understand that there are over 5,300 complete Greek manuscripts available, and there are over 10,000 complete copies of the Latin Vulgate. There are at least 9,300 other early manuscript copies in other languages, and there are over 24,000 partial manuscript copies. And so we're just dealing with an enormous amount of manuscript evidence. Now, just to give you some details by way of comparison, let's look at some other writings of antiquity, some other writings of, of old age. Uh, we've all heard of Plato. Plato wrote about 427 to 437 B.C. The earliest copy available was in 900 A.D. of Plato's writings. And so a span of 1,200 years had passed between the original writing and the earliest copy that's available. And the number of copies of Plato's writing that are available is seven. We only have seven copies of what Plato wrote. Perhaps you've heard of Aristotle. Aristotle wrote between 384 B.C. and 322 B.C. The earliest copy of Aristotle's writings is about 1100 A.D. And so 1400 years passed between the time when Aristotle wrote and the earliest available copy of Aristotle's writing. 1400 years and there are only five copies. And we could go through and look at a, a whole list of different writers from many, many years ago and see the, the span of time that had passed between when they wrote and the first available copy that, that has been found and the number of copies. And generally, there's a long length of time, anywhere from 700 years to as much as 1,500 years, and only a few copies available. Now, let me tell you about the Bible. The Bible was written between 45 to 96 A.D. The earliest available copy is something that is dated for 130 A.D., only 40 years passing from the time of writing to the first available copy. That's of a writing of John. How many copies are there? 
well over 25,000 copies of the New Testament available. Now, how does that compare to the seven copies of Plato or to the five copies of Aristotle? And both of those, over a thousand years had passed between the time that those men had written and the earliest available copy of their writing. With the New Testament, there are over 25,000 copies available. 25,000 manuscripts and only 40 years having passed between the time of writing and the earliest copy available. Just amazing manuscript evidence. A few more things for us to consider. As we look into the Bible, we see it being rather impartial in the way that it speaks about things. Books that are written by men, when speaking either biographically or autobiographically, generally avoid mentioning a whole lot about the errors and wrongs of those individuals that it's written about. But when we go to the Bible, we see that the Bible lays the sins of those that are spoken of open for all to see. David, the great king of Israel, we read about his episode with Bathsheba and how he allowed a sin spiral to take over his life. Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus, we read about him saying that he's going to go to death with Jesus if need be and then denying Jesus three times afterwards. Later on, when the Gentiles are brought into the church as well, we read that Paul needed to rebuke Peter because Peter withdrew himself from the Gentiles. We read about Moses as he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock the way that God had told him to, and so Moses was not permitted to enter into the promised land. The Bible lays open before all to see, for all time, the sins of of these great characters of faith, these great individuals, that is not something that is characteristic of the writing of men. But, again, the Bible does not claim to be the writing of men. It claims to be a book from God. Also, friends, I want us to look at some prophetic accuracy in the Bible. And we, we can't look at all the prophecies that are revealed but there are a few things that I want us to look at. If we go ahead and turn to Micah chapter 5 and notice at verse 2. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Apathra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. That's quite a prophecy. Here is Micah, a prophet who was around about 800 years before the time of Christ, saying about Bethlehem, this little town that's south of Jerusalem, that out of you will come the Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now understand that Jesus' parents weren't even residents of Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth of Galilee. And yet, at the time when Jesus was about to be born, there was a census which required Joseph to go back to Bethlehem, where his family had been from, so that he might be counted for the census. And while there, in Bethlehem, Jesus was born. Some might look at that and say, well, that was a coincidence. But yet here's Micah, 800 years before it took place, saying, out of Bethlehem would come the Savior of the world. If you go with me to Psalm and chapter 22, in Psalm 22 we have David writing about the sufferings that the Christ would go through. And there are just so many pictures in this psalm that match up with what we see taking place when Jesus went to Calvary. If you look with me in Psalm 22 and at verse 16 beginning, David writes, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. 
They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Certainly we can see, as we read that, the fulfillment of it when Jesus went to the cross. Understand that what David is writing here was written about a thousand years before Christ. And there are specific truths about the crucifixion that are being foretold. Now, first of all, understand that when David was writing this, crucifixion was not in use. Crucifixion didn't come around until the time of the Romans, basically. And yet he says at the end of verse 16, They pierced my hands and my feet. That is an obvious sign of crucifixion. In verse 17, I can count all my bones. Remember at the end of the day, the soldiers went through and they broke the legs of both thieves who were on either side of Jesus. But Jesus' legs they did not break. I can count all my bones. He says in verse 18, They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Remember at the base of the cross, there were the Roman guards, the soldiers, and they were dividing up the garments of Jesus. Certainly the Roman soldiers didn't know what the Bible said and played their part in order to fulfill. It was a prophecy that was made. And the soldiers did what they did, not knowing that they were fulfilling a prophecy made through the hand of David. The Bible has prophetic accuracy. We've just looked at a couple. We could look at numerous prophecies that show fulfillment, absolute, complete fulfillment of what God revealed beforehand. The evidence is overwhelming in support of the inspiration of the Bible. There's much more that we could look at, but for time's sake, we're not able to today. But if it is a book from God, then we need to consider our responsibility to it. Take a look in John chapter 12 and at verse 47 and 48. Jesus says, If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Friend, if this is a book from God, if these words are words by the Savior, then we have a responsibility to our souls to obey the things that are written, to receive the word and act upon the word so that we might share in the promises that are revealed in the Word of God, and we might avoid the punishments that are mentioned therein. If God wrote a book, He did write a book. And we have it before us, the Scriptures. Let's do our part then, in response to the will of God, to be obedient servants before Him. Friend, I'd like to invite you to come and worship with us today. We're starting a special series of lessons today that show external evidence for the accuracy of the Bible. We're going to be looking at Chinese characters and seeing the story of Genesis 1-11 through in the Chinese language, a language that predates the writing of Genesis. We invite you to come and to enjoy these lessons and to learn about the will of God. If we can help you in other ways, if we can send a Bible correspondence course your way, or set up a home Bible study, let us know. We're interested in studying with you and helping you to come to a better knowledge of the truth. We thank you for your good attention today. We encourage you to tune in again next week at this same time. We wish you a great day and a good week.